You're listening to a message presented at New Market Christian Church. We're located at 300 South 3rd Street in New Market, Indiana. We meet for Sunday school at 9 o'clock and for worship at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. If you do not have a church home, we'd love to invite you to join us here at New Market Christian Church. And now, a message by Dr. Gary Snowden. Oh man, have you ever just had a hard time with the alarm clock? I, I don't know what it is with those things, but they seem to disturb me on a regular basis. You, you ever notice that? I titled this morning, Wake Up, The Alarm Is Sounding. I'm guessing you probably had that same kind of experience with alarm clocks over the years. They, they, they tend to bug us just a little bit. How many of you have ever heard the, the sound of your alarm in the morning and then simply reached over and, and when you found it, hit snooze? Anybody ever done that? Yeah, yeah. you got to raise your hand. It's every morning. Boom, boom, boom. You know, or worse yet, maybe, how many of you have woke up hours after the alarm was supposed to go off and discovered that you missed something important or at least you're just about to be late for it. Does that ever happen to anybody? Yeah, these alarm clocks, they, they, I tell you what, they can really get your life going. I, I think that there are times when, um, when this might have happened to you too. It's, it's happened to me before. Have you ever got a brand new alarm clock and you set that thing not having any idea what it was going to sound like when it rang and the next morning it scared you half to death? Has that, has that ever happened before? Man, that's scary. You wake up and, you know, there's all kinds of alarms on there. One of them, I was going down through alarm sounds and it had wolves howling in the background. Ooh, ooh. You wake up to that, that makes you just about, never mind what it makes you just about do, it scares you half to death. Now, whenever those kind of things happen, it's just a rude awakening. Yeah, that, I guess that's what alarm clocks are supposed to do. They're, they're supposed to wake you up. These kind of sudden awakenings, that's the kind of thing we're going to be talking about this morning. Those sudden awakenings when all at once you realize something's going on that you're going to have to deal with. Something's going, going on in your life that you're going to have to pay attention to. It's an aha moment, if you will. You know those aha moments that we come to? It's entirely possible that we've made some life choices that have taken us down some pretty difficult paths leading us to one of those aha moments. I mean, maybe we've come to realize that self-help just isn't going to cut it anymore. We're going to need something more than that because our life choices has taken us down a path where we're coming to a brick wall that we don't know how to deal with. No matter how hard we try, we just can't seem to get back on track. I mean, if you're a liar, you tell yourself, I'm never going to lie again. And what happens 10 minutes later? You lie. Or what happens if you're a thief and you tell yourself you're never going to steal again? And then you see that pretty pen laying on the table right across from you. You're tempted to do it all over again. You fill in the blanks as far as those things that tempt you. You know, whenever we get to those aha moments we finally come to realize we need to change directions. We need to try and get it right. And we try to do it, and we try to do it on our own, and it seems as if we fail over and over again because, quite frankly, we can't do these things by ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit in us, working through us, to help us through these aha moments when we come to realize there's something in our life that's just plain messed up, that we failed someplace, we failed miserably, and we need to get back on the right track. For instance, a college student's grades comes in the mail. His partying has resulted in him losing a full ride scholarship. My son could tell you about that one. Things happen in life. Aha moments. That can be an aha moment when you realize you need to turn your life around, you need to get back on track, and my son can also tell you about that. I'm very proud of him. He stood up like a man, he took it on the chin, 
and he turns his life around and he's done very well for himself. He did finish college, but he had to pay for it. Aha moments. She's a junior in high school holding a pregnancy test with trembling hands, just waiting for the result. My friends, that can be an aha moment. He started to log off on an inappropriate website to leave his history when suddenly he realizes his wife is standing right behind him with tears in her eyes. That can be an aha moment. Aha moments. Aha moments are a reality in life. You're driving down the road 80 miles an hour and you see the flashing lights behind you. An aha moment. Yeah, you know, aha moments, they happen in life. Sooner or later, the alarm is going to sound and we're going to find out that if we keep doing the things that we're doing and the ways that we're doing them, eventually we'll have to pay the piper. It's just the way life works. Aha moments. We come to realize that if we're going to get past these things that keep bringing us down, we need the help of Almighty God. Because I'm telling you, all of us struggle with things in life that when we try to get rid of them on our own, we just can't get her done. We need to turn to God, and we need to ask Him for His help. When our alarm sounds, and we realize that we've wandered into a distant country, just like the man in today's story, we end up with one of those aha moments. Like the son in Luke chapter 15. You can read that story on your own. I'm not going to read that whole chapter to you. But there in Luke chapter 15, you're going to read a story about a young man who didn't hear the alarm until he had made it all the way to the pig pen. He ignored it until he got all the way to the pig pen. Now that alarm should have rang earlier. That alarm should have been ringing when he requested his inheritance early, basically saying, Dad, I can't wait for you to die. I want my inheritance now. It should have rang after a few weeks in a foreign land when his wallet began to feel lighter. And all that money in there, and suddenly all that money was gone. It should have rang. It should have rang when the famine swept through the land. And he saw things getting more and more difficult where he was living. It should have rang. And it did ring. It's just that he wasn't listening. It should have rang when he requested a job as a pig tender. I mean, for a Jew, the alarm should have been going off. Looking back, one might wonder, how in the world did that young man miss all of those alarms? I mean, they were ringing and they were ringing and they were ringing. But just like today, it is really easy to become desensitized to the sound of alarms. It is. When is the last time you went running to a car in the Walmart parking lot because you heard an alarm ring? Yeah, we, we hear that all the time in the parking lots. But we've just gotten used to those alarms, haven't we? We look up and we say, well, there's another one. We don't run to them anymore because we've become desensitized to them. We simply ignore them. That same thing can happen to God-given alarms if you and I aren't careful. We can become desensitized to the alarms of God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 15 and 16, it kind of talks about that happening. Look with me there in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 15 to 16. It'll be on the screen back here behind me, or you can look it up and follow along. What it says there is, The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again, because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. In essence, they began to just ignore all the warnings that God sent through his prophets, through his messengers. Just ignore them. Let me share with you some examples in God's word of God providing warnings for people and sometimes people just plain ignore them. 
way back in the book of Genesis, you all remember this story. Way back there in the book of Genesis, remember how that Cain and Abel both brought offerings before God. And God accepted one of those offerings, and he rejected the other one. And as a result of him accepting Abel's offering and rejecting Cain's offering, Cain was madder than a wet hen. He was ticked at the rejection of God. Now God knew that Cain was headed in a bad direction. So God sounded the alarm. How much clearer can you get than God himself coming down and saying, you better watch it. <laughs> Here's your alarm. But that's exactly what happened in Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Once again, it's going to be up on the screen, but you can look it up there if you want to. It says, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin, the warning, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. In essence, woo, 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 here's your warning coming from God himself. This is your warning, Cain. You need to get your act together. Once the warning was sounded, God stepped back. He stepped back. And it was up to Cain to choose whether he would heed the warning or reject the warning. It was his choice. Cain was allowed to exercise his own free will when it comes to listening to the commands and the, the alarms of God. Did you know that you and I are given that same opportunity? God says, thou shalt not kill, but it's up to us to make a choice not to murder. He says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbors, and you fill in the blank. But it's up to us to live by those precepts, by those principles. He gives us the warning. He makes it clear. But we all have to make the choice. Ultimately, ultimately Cain ignored the alarm. Just like the prodigal son ignored all of the alarms of God. And that led to devastation in both cases. I'd like to share with you this morning how sometimes God uses other people to sound the alarm for you and me. Did you know he does that? He can use other people to sound alarms for us. In Proverbs chapter 27, verses 5 and 6, it kind of describes how this works. It says there, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies what? Multiplies kisses. Just make sure that you're following along with me. A friend will multiply kisses. Oh, you're wonderful. Oh, it's just fine. But a true friend will tell you exactly how it is. God will send people into our lives to sound the alarm for us, but it's often not what we want to hear. I mean, we like the people kiss us on the cheek and tell us we're doing a good job, right? We don't like it when somebody comes up and says, you need to get your act together. But what we really need to hear is, you need to get your act together sometimes. A good friend will sound the alarm whether we want to hear what he has to say or not. These kinds of friends will question our spending when our spending seems to be out of control. These kind of friends will encourage us not to miss the worship services because they know how important they are. These kinds of friends will question the new relationship that we're getting ourselves involved in. Maybe we're blind to what's happening, but they can see what's going on, and they will question it and ask us to think about it. They will say what needs to be said even though they don't want to because they know that the alarm needs to be sounded. I mean, people don't want to walk up to you and tell you, you know you got a booger on your nose. <laughs> but a true friend will do that, won't they? They don't want you walking around with a booger on your nose, they want you to get it cleaned off and, and be able to move forward. That's what true friends do. Sometimes God uses our friends to sound the alarm for us, to tell us to get our act together. Do you know he also sometimes uses a taste of future consequences to sound the alarm? He does. It might be a fender bender as you're driving home drunk one night that keeps you from a future Ford car pileup. Uh, think about that for a minute. I had a young man in my office. Won't miss it. It doesn't matter. He's dead now. But I had a young man in my office, and he, uh, he was telling me, well, I got drunk the other night, and I sideswiped a car on the way home. About two weeks later, he came and he said to me, I got drunk the other night. Man, I totaled this car out here. A few weeks ago, 
I heard that he was shot by the police. God sounds the warning. God sounds the alarm. But it's up to us to listen. Sometimes he will use just a little taste of what the future circumstances are going to be like to let us know what's coming if we don't get our act together. For instance, we might bounce a check reminding us that we're on our way to bankruptcy if we don't get things together. Just the way God works. God will give us times that we can sample just a little bit of what's ahead in order to try and get us back on the right track. He does this so that we can change directions before we crash and burn. I'm so glad that he does. I am guessing that since hindsight is 2020, I'm guessing probably everyone in this room can think back to a time in their life when God sent a warning to you. Maybe you listened, maybe you didn't. But you're looking back and you're thinking, man, God was trying to tell me something was up. God was pointing this out to me. I should have listened. I'm guessing that we've all faced consequences which have made it clear that trouble's ahead if we keep going in the direction that we're headed in. For instance, when you're growing up and your mom warns you, if you do that again, you're going to have to go get me a switch off the tree. I mean, they give you a warning, don't they? God does the same thing. He gives us a warning. If you don't want to catch it, you need to listen up. You need to get your act together. I'd like to share with you some biblical examples. I think the most obvious of these examples in Scripture was the example of Cain. I can't deny that, but it goes farther than just the example of Cain. Let me share a couple of scriptures that ties Cain with some other people in order that we can find out from the Word of God that he's watching over us and he's making it clear that the examples of others can make a difference in our life. We see somebody else screw up and we see what happens to them and it can help us stay on track. For example, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Do not be like who? Didn't we just talk about him? Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Well, it wasn't just Cain. The Bible points that out too in Jude. Jude verses 10 and 11 would say, Yet these people slander what they do not understand. And the very things that they do understand by instinct, as rational animals do, will destroy them. Woe to them. They have taken the way of... Cain, they have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. He says it's not just Cain. There's other people that you can learn from. See their mistakes and don't do what they did. Cain got angry and killed his brother. Balaam wanted money so he sold out God. Korah was aggravated that her brother was in control of things and tried to step in and usurp authority. I mean, just think about the examples that he's using there. These people serve as examples of what will happen if we ignore the alarm that God continues to sound into our ears. There's something about seeing someone else experience consequences of decisions that they've made in their life that help us when we're tempted to make those same decisions. We look at what happened to them and we think to ourselves, I don't want that happening to me. It can be a real wake-up call that can help us come to our senses. I guess as we're on this path called life, there's some questions that we need to ask ourselves when we're making choices. How about these? Where's this path leading? That's a pretty good question to ask. If I get on this path, where's this path leading? If I continue to do this, where's this going to lead me to? What happened to others who have gone down this path before me? I mean, you, you can look around you. You can see people who are, are doing the thing that you're thinking about doing. What happened to them? How did it work out for the last person that was less than honest on his expense report at work? How'd that work out for him? Lose his job? How did it work out? Probably not so good. How did it work out for our neighbor who thought that she could fool around without her husband finding out? How did that work out for her? How's it worked out for others who have tried to cheat on exams at college? How's that worked out for them? How's it worked out for folks who tried to buy their children's way into college not long ago? How's that working out for them? How's it worked out for others 
who have tried to cheat on their taxes? How's it worked out for others who constantly put work before family? Their experiences should serve as warnings, examples, alarms, if you will, for you and I. If we travel the same path, we're most likely going to end up in the same place. Scary thought, isn't it? I wish that I could request what Elijah requested for his servant in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16 when we're facing these hard times. Because it's really easy for us to say, this is just too hard for me. I can't make this marriage work. It's really easy for us to say, I just can't do this. I've got to get money somewhere. I'm going to have to take a third job. It's really easy for us to say to ourselves, and you fill in the blank, I've got to do this in order to get this. I can't do this by myself. I'm overwhelmed by it. It's just too big for me. Have you ever felt that way? It's just too big for me. I don't know how I'm going to get her done. Well, that's where Elijah was along with his servant. And we read in uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16, we read about the king of Aram who surrounded Elisha and his servant. And the servant's standing there looking at his, at his master, Elisha, and he's saying, Elisha, we's in big trouble. There ain't no way in the world we're going to whoop all these folks that are coming up against us. We are outnumbered. We are outgunned. We don't stand a chance. His servant was terrified. And Elisha, Elisha, when he cried out, what are we going to do, simply said, now wait a minute. I love this. He says in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16, as he looked up into the sky on the mountains that surrounded him, he said these words, and they ring true today. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are far more than those who are with them. No matter how big the problem, you need to know that there are angels all around us watching over us, fighting the battles for us. We're going to talk about spiritual battles in the weeks to come. I want you to know that there are people out there on flaming horses and chariots just waiting to come to our rescue. That's what it was back then. I wonder if it's tanks and Tommy guns now. I don't know what they got, but... But the angels are up there fighting the battles for us. And Elijah's servant, whenever he saw what Elijah pointed to, whenever God opened his eyes, he began to realize Elisha was exactly right. We may not be able to conquer this on our own, but with the help of God, we can get through this. We need to be brutally honest with ourselves. We're surrounded by enemy forces. We need to be brutally honest with ourselves. We are in the pig pen just like that prodigal son was. If we are, if we are giving in to some sin in our life, we're wallowing in the mud. We're far, far away from God. We're living with a bunch of pigs. We're starving. Physically, spiritually, we're starving. And we're thinking to ourselves, in God's house, in my Father's house, the servants, the ones who sweep the floor have it better off than I've got it right now. I am in a mess. We need to admit that we are in a mess and that we need God's help to get out of it. We need to take immediate action. We need to leave the pigs. Turn your back on those sins that are weighing you down. You've got to leave the pigs and you need to head home. Head back toward God because He is standing there with open arms. We must prepare ourselves to humbly request forgiveness of God. He tells us in 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Never be afraid to run into the arms of your Heavenly Father because when you do, like Elisha and his servants, God is going to be there with you and for you. We must recognize that God has the resources to help us out of even the most difficult of circumstances if we will turn those circumstances over to Him. But we've got to be willing to look to Him. Self-help simply won't cut it when you're in the pig pen. We need God's help. And He'll provide that help if we're willing to surrender absolutely everything to Him. 
If you're ready to surrender all of those things that are weighing you down to Christ, then there's no better time than now to stand and say, God, I surrender it all to you. As we stand, as we sing our invitation hymn, I surrender all. You've been listening to a message presented by Dr. Gary Snowden, minister at New Market Christian Church. We would love to have you come join us as we seek to worship God, love one another, and reach out to our neighbors.